So I'm really thrilled to invite uh, Dr. Jennifer Atkinson here uh, for our first in our climate lecture series. Dr. Atkinson is an associate professor of environmental humanities at the University of Washington Bothell, where she teaches on a number of things, including uh, the topic of this year's climate lecture series, which is around climate anxiety and hope. Um, her seminars uh, have been featured in a number of places, including the New York Times, National Geographic, Washington Post Magazine, and others, um, because of their importance to central questions facing us uh, when we look at the climate crisis and how, it, how we deal with it as communities, as people, as individuals. Her work more broadly asks important questions about the intersections of racial justice, privilege, trauma, colonialism, and climate change, and its proposed solutions. She often asks, what are the psychological burdens of climate change on different people and communities? How do race, gender, economic inequality, and privilege shape the emotional toll of climate disruption? And how do we help each other navigate these really serious questions around uh, doom and gloom of environmental disasters? She regularly works with uh, youth activists, psychologists, climate scientists, and others to approach the problem of the climate crisis in an interdisciplinary way. And you can hear a lot more about this on her podcast called Facing It, which is a really focuses on tools uh, to deal with eco-anxiety and putting those tools into action. So I invite everybody to check that out. I'd also like to make a plug for uh, Dr. Atkinson's work uh, in something called the Existential Toolkit for Climate Justice Educators, which I believe there is a book manuscript being prepared now, um, which offers a number of, uh, again, tools for dealing with um, difficult conversations around climate justice and climate breakdown, but also giving us hope, which is really what the, the topic of today's talk is. Um, and so with that, I just want to say the talk today is titled Beyond Climate Despair, Reclaiming Hope in a Warming World. And I'm just so thrilled um, to have Professor Atkinson with us. Please join me in welcoming her here um, as our inaugural speaker. Great, thank you so much, Anthony, for inviting me and for all of you who joined today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here as the rest of the people are being admitted from the waiting room. Okay. Um, so I just wanna acknowledge that I'm, I'm joining you today remotely from the University of Washington in, in Bothell, which sits on the unceded Sammamish and Duwamish lands and waters, which are part of the shared waters of tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip and Muckleshoot nations. And what I'm gonna do is talk for about 45 minutes today and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Um, if you do, let's see if I can find the chat here again, yeah. If you do need to leave early, which happens sometimes, um, um, but you wanna revisit any material that I cover today, you can check out my podcast. Uh, so I just put a link in the chat and also my website. I, I try to um, include most of the articles and research and concepts that I cover in my slides um, are also on my website. So if you like an article comes up and that I mentioned and you say, oh, I wanna see that study, go to the website and it's usually listed under resources. Um, so I wanted to start off um, in the in the chat here to ask everybody, at least anybody who's comfortable, to share um, a word or a phrase that describes how you feel when you think about climate change or our climate future. So it could be anything, one word, a couple words, a phrase. Uh, if you just drop that into the chat, kind of want to get a sense of <laughs> doomed, bleak. Overwhelmed, worried, depressed, desperate, anxiety, complicated, anxiety, urgency, responsibility, concern, dehumanized. Wow, frustrated. This is. This is heavy. Anthony, difficult but possible to change. Confused again. Wow. All right. Well, thank you for sharing this. These are difficult emotions, and it's it's something that's um difficult difficult to to take on. 
Um, I see an, an iPhone uh, identified user says ready to get ready. So <laughs> that's that's a, um, where I hope everybody will feel at the end of this talk. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with the standard formula for climate talks. Like they pretty much always start off with a bunch of bad news. And it's so easy to find it if you follow the headlines. I mean, we just had this summer of record setting heat waves across North America and China and Europe and California. Um, there were the, the deadly um, historic floods in Pakistan, the recent hurricane we just had in, in Florida. You know, you can just sit here all day naming off events like this. And, and any one of those stories that you pick out is just another punctuation mark in this relentless narrative of, of climate crises from mass extinction and sea level rise to displacement, um, habitat loss, cultural loss, smelting ice sheets, ocean acidification, like it just goes on and on. And I assume that you already know that story. Um, you know, for all of us who follow the headlines and the scientific reports, we can get pulled into a downward spiral of heartbreak and grief. And a lot of, you know, the, the feelings that you all just shared in the Zoom chat. Um, someone once described living in this age of climate breakdown as an experience of broken record record breaking. And I think it's just a perfect summary of our time. So I always start my talks by acknowledging um, that in addition to the external damage that we have to address, there's this landscape of internal damage that we're carrying inside of us as well. And there really has been an explosion of research on the emotional and psychological toll of this in the, just in the past four or five years. Uh, the term eco-anxiety was runner-up for Oxford, Oxford's Word of the Year in 2019. And then last year, just to use a Google metric, um, searches for the term climate anxiety were up 565%. The American Psycholos uh, Psychological Association put out a major report a few years ago. Um, they define eco-anxiety as a chronic fear of environmental doom. Um, it's more complicated than that. There's a lot of different terms and ways that people come about this. Um, the ones listed here, you know, you might have heard terms like climate trauma, pre-traumatic stress, global dread. I really like Britt Ray's definition. Uh, she's a science writer and has a book out that I'm going to plug a couple times during this talk where she says, at its simplest, at this late stage in the climate crisis, eco-anxiety is merely a sign of attachment to the world. Um, and I've personally became interested in this topic for a number of reasons, one of which was my direct experience of these endless wildfires in California. Um, it's where I grew up and I still spend a lot of time there um, and my family has been directly impacted with wildfires um, right outside their, their front doors having to flee from that. You know, but even before that, I was struggling with climate despair just in response to the day to day stuff, um, whether it's the latest IPCC report that came out or seeing a, a terrible headline or an image like this on the slide, I would like plunge into such a dark place where it felt like nothing really mattered that we were doing because the problem was just so big and we were coming to it uh, so late in the game. And I share that not because my personal experience is really that important or unique but actually for the opposite reason, because it is not unique. There are so many people who feel this way, um, but up until very recently, talking about dark emotional dimensions was just not really something that we have done in, in climate discussions. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one is that, oh, I'll go to this one in a second. In my own case, and I think this is true for a lot of educators and activists, and many of you might identify with this, where you feel like you always have to project optimism and hope or the people around you are going to lose heart. Um, but then I think the, the bigger reason um, is that our society has consistently refused to, to face the psychological dimensions of climate breakdown because we have treated the climate story primarily as a science story. And this has been true for the past 30 years. In, where scientists have really been the main communicators and they're the ones that we see up, you know, being interviewed on the news. Um, and so the, the discourse about planetary destruction has really been heavily kind of uh, framed with statistics and graphs and numerical equations. And it's not at all to disparage scientists. I mean, they're just doing what scientists do and that is the nature of the discipline, um, that particular language and mode of representation. Oops. <laughs> 
Um, you can all still see my slides, right? Okay. Um, but there are, there are other ways to tell this story, um, especially when in the midst of all these external changes, so many of us are carrying this unconscious grief or conscious grief, because I think at, at any level, almost everybody knows that the, the world is in trouble and systems are unraveling and there is a lot more loss to come. And in a society of collective denial like that and kind of organized mass distraction, that pain becomes a kind of shadow that's following us around and making many people just more and more desperate to avoid what we know is true. Um, so even for non-scientists, I think that scientific framing that, that just sticks with the numbers and the data to represent these losses, it's, it's alluring because it excludes the subjective elements. And I remember reading, um, so this book by Margaret Klein Solomon, um, she talks about that compartmentalization that so many activists kind of fall into and how for years she herself relegated climate to what she calls the science part of her brain because it just felt so much less painful and risky. Um, but eventually you, you discover that that strategy doesn't work. Um, you know, we could just as well say that cancer is an issue for science to solve. But for anybody who's facing a diagnosis or who's close to somebody who's ill, you immediately understand that a big part of the challenge um, isn't just oops, um, the medical scientific elements, right? But the processing the fear and the grief of anticipatory loss. So you can't just tell somebody with, with cancer, well, this is something for science to sort out. But even if it did work to push that heartbreak out of the conversations, one of the main arguments I want to make today is that there's something essential that's lost when we do so. And that's going to be the second half of my talk on hope and resilience. Um, but before we get there, I want to spend a, a couple minutes outlining like what some of the mental health impacts of climate change are um, and who's who's impacted. Uh, the version that I just described for myself where, you know, there's that sense of loss that's following you around like a shadow. I think that falls under this general concept of solastalgia. So philosopher Glenn Albrecht coined this term. It's really become pretty mainstream now. He's playing on the language of nostalgia, um, a longing for a time or a place that, that you can't go back to. But solastalgia happens when home itself becomes unfamiliar. So it's not that you've left the place, but you feel like the place has left you. And anybody here can probably give a whole list of examples where, you know, whether it's you see less bees out in your garden or fewer songbirds, um, like all of the days now that we can't spend outside because of the smoke and the heat, um, all those kind of changes um, from what you remember as a kid or even just a few years ago. There are also more acute for forms of climate distress um, under the second bullet here. And what originally motivated me to learn about this topic, besides my own personal experience, was I think even the more important was seeing the impact on my students. So these are some quotes from the first day of a very recent class um, I taught at UW where I asked my students how they felt about the future. And you can see how dark this is here. I, I feel hopeless useless and minuscule, why even bother bringing children into an already dying world, using descriptors like whirlwind of despair. Um, the last one on the far left, uh, seeing the planet break down has made me break down. And the data show that this is a, a global phenomenon. This is not just tree huggers out here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, Last fall, the largest research study that's ever been done on the mental health impacts of climate change for young people showed how profound this uh, psychological distress is. This was published in The Lancet after the team surveyed over 10,000 teens from across the world. So this is like Nigeria, Finland, Australia, Brazil, the Philippines, um, the U.S., uh, 56% of youth said that they believe humanity is doomed. And I did see that come up in the chat as well, the word doom. 45% uh, said that climate anxiety disrupts daily activities like sleeping or focusing on schoolwork or just like trying to enjoy yourselves while you're hanging out with your friends. 
One in four uh, are afraid to have children and 77 uh, characterized our climate future as frightening. So, you know, the injustice here is that the failure to act on climate is robbing young people, not just of ecological stability, but also of their joy and their well-being. And in fact, this study shows that the despair of young people has a very high correlation with a sense of being betrayed by governments and lied to by leaders who are, are not doing what needs to be done. Um, many said that they actually felt that they could deal with climate impacts themselves, but what made this, um, oh shoot, hold on. Um, yeah, this is the one I want. What made this um, un so unbearable for them was that adults, you know, the people who are supposed to be protecting them are turning away. So there is a sense of moral injury, like the, and the authors explicitly use that term. Um, that moral injury is what is really undermining people's sense of hope in the future. Um, and that emotional harm is a matter of intergenerational equality in this case, but it's also a matter more broadly of, of racial and economic um, inequality. Oops, I'll go back to that slide. So in the response um, or in the in the responses from that study, concern about climate change was actually concentrated much more heavily in poorer countries and communities of color, like the very people who have contributed the least to greenhouse gas emissions. And yet they're the ones that are suffering the, the heaviest climate impacts and therefore the highest emotional toll. So the example on this sh uh, slide shows then the Philippines, 92% of youth said that the future was frightening compared with 68% um, in the US. And I think it's also captured in, in the statement from Mitzi Tan here, um, a young person from the Philippines who told the researchers that she grew up afraid of drowning in her own bedroom because of her experience with the floods. Okay, backwards here. And then this aligns, I think, with the third category of increasing numbers of people who have experienced actual trauma from um, extreme climate-related events. So this is more than just anxiety about the future, but the direct impacts like right here and right now. And there is just a growing body of mental health research, including that major report from the APA I mentioned that has linked extreme weather disasters to chronic anxiety and depression, traumatic grief, post-traumatic stress, sleep disorder, substance abuse. And these effects have been shown to develop in anywhere between quarter to a half of people impacted and then once again, overwhelmingly, we're talking here about marginalized communities, communities of color, um, anybody who lacks the resources to escape, to survive, to recover after the event. Climate change is also disrupting people's identity and livelihood and subsistence. And that's especially true for those whose ways of life are closely tied to the land. Um, within many indigenous communities, Warming climate is, is wiping out traditional hunting and fishing and cultural practices, um, whether we're talking about the decline of salmon here in Washington state or communities in the Arctic who can't travel to ancestral sites or hunt in the traditional ways because the landscape is melting uh, beneath them. And when we talk about climate change as an existential threat, this is really like the quintessential example since it's not only a threat to life and survival, but also to these people's culture, their relation to the past, their entire way of being um, in the world, like their relation to their ancestors. And, and for that reason, the current experience of climate injustice is really magnifying both past and ongoing traumas for colonized people. Nyla Burton um, has a really moving article on this, and I put the title up on this slide, because I think it's a really great piece if you decide to do any follow-up reading today. Um, I also included a link to it on the resources page of my website. And then second to last area I'll mention, um, this is research on the um, um, that's linking hotter temperatures to increased aggression. Um, so on hot days, we have more uh, fights at sports events and people honking horns, more domestic abuse, more violent crime. This has actually been shown again and again in countless cities um, all over the place. So when we think about what this means for an increasingly warming world, it's another real area of concern. 
And I actually, I also included this quote from Romeo and Juliet because even Shakespeare comment, commented on this phenomenon. So I think it's one of those um, instances of, of where science is just now catching up with something that's long been known in common folk wisdom. Um, and then the final area I'll mention where we see the mental health toll of climate change is with suicide. Um, examples range from despairing activists uh, to suicide among the Arctic communities that I just talked about. Um, and this is being tracked everywhere from like farming regions in India with, with growers taking their lives when they face failed crops all the way to affluent countries like Australia, which had its own spike in suicide during the millennial drought where farmers watched their livestock die and their, their land blow, um, blow away after it had dried up. Also the Virgin Islands, when they were hit a few years back with a, a major hurricane twice in a single season, the governor there declared a mental health state of emergency when attempted suicide became like a secondary disaster after the, um, the storm itself. So all of this is just a, a you know, a partial snapshot of some different ways that our climate crisis is driving this mental health crisis. But what I want to do for the rest of the time here is argue that there really is, is more to the story as well, that climate doesn't just impact mental health, but the reverse is also true. Our ability to cultivate emotional resilience is going to determine how well we respond to the crisis going forward. So this is where our agency lies. Uh, and so I think it's also where the story really can become much more empowering. And I do want to point out that, you know, some people might see this focus on emotional response as a way of kind of retreating from social and political changes um, that we need. But it's really important to remember that our inner resilience is exactly what equips us to do the work of addressing the structural external conditions that are driving climate upheavals in the first place. So we have this two-way dynamic where climate change is impacting mental health, but mental health is also impacting um, what happens with, with the climate situation. So with all that said, my main purpose today is really to share some thoughts about how we might start that process of building um, an existential capacity by reimagining our own relationship with grief and anxiety or around um, the climate crisis. And then second, how we might reconsider some conventional assumptions about hope as we think about the work ahead. So I'm going to dive into the first piece by reading a three minute excerpt from a podcast that I created. Um, Anthony mentioned it's called Facing It, and it explores how dark emotions like grief might actually be a doorway to something powerful that we have forgotten in this whole conversation about climate change. And apologies if you've come to my other talks before, um, that's the same excerpt I always read, but it's because this particular excerpt reflects on the, the course that I designed at the University of Washington to help students cope with climate grief. Um, and what I found when I walked into the class on the first day is there's this like room full of students who saw grief as a problem that they wanted to, me to help them solve. They wanted me to help them go make it go away. And that really enabled me to recognize the same misunderstanding that I had been carrying around as well. Um, and this is a, um, the images on the slide as I'm reading here are from one of my own students who took the seminar on eco grief. Okay. When I first launched my seminar on eco grief, I was every bit as distressed as my students and looking for ways to extinguish my pain for all this suffering. But something unexpected happened along the way. I had always thought of grief as a bad thing, a dark state to avoid or overcome as quickly as possible. I thought that feeling grief was like succumbing to a preventable illness or that once it took hold, I might fall into a bottomless hole of despair. But in time, it dawned on us that maybe we were seeking solutions to the wrong problem. We all wanted to fix the way we felt so we could go back to feeling happy. But grief isn't something to be fixed because it's not dysfunctional. In fact, it's a healthy and necessary process we have to undergo in order to heal. First, grief isn't one of just one of many options for accepting loss. Grief is the process of accepting loss. 
I get why many people working towards sustainability want to sidestep emotional issues and push the public straight into action. The situation is urgent and dwelling on our feelings can seem like an extravagance as the fires close in. But the problem is when we try to jump straight to the final step without first processing the emotional toll of all this lost beauty and life, we're bypassing the very insights that motivate us to fight for our world in the first place. Ignoring ecological grief is like trying to rush, rush through any great loss, a job, a home, someone you love, without pausing to acknowledge what you're leaving behind. And in all those cases, we're not just losing something we once had, we're also losing the future that many of us had counted on. We can't act creatively and honestly in this new reality until we mourn the passing of the old one. And all the ancient wisdom traditions affirm this truth, that grief is not here to take us hostage. It is the agent needed to transform us so that we can confront a similarly transformed world. Um, so that's the excerpt just from the, um, I can't remember which episode it is, but as this, as the podcast is going on, I, I actually try to then push beyond just reframing grief as something that's not bad to also consider ways that it is actively good. So first of all, say the same thing in every talk I've ever given in my career, grief arises from love and deep attachment. You will not grieve for something that you don't love. Um, grief is a way of honoring our connection and our empathy with other species or other people. And it's, it's when we feel that pain that we remember how much our existence and our well-being are entwined with the lives of, of others. Um, and a student, I, I really like, they, they shared um, a Marvel Comics miniseries uh, quote that they took. It's, it's um, actually quite profound on this point. And it's where the character says, what is grief? if not love persevering. Um, one of my own favorite quotes is from Malkia Devich Cyril, where she wrote, joy is not the opposite of grief. Grief is the opposite of indifference. Grief is an evolutionary indicator of love, the kind of great love that guides revolutionaries. And I think recognizing this is so essential for my students and for any climate activist or you know, anybody who has internalized that assumption that grief leads to inaction. Um, and this is partly because we live in such a grief phobic culture where the moment you say that word, the image that comes to mind is someone who can't get out of bed and who is just like paralyzed by pain, um, who is depleted. I think the truth is that, that grief, it's insofar as our grief is commensurate with our love um, and they are two sides really of the same coin, that embracing and channeling rather than suppressing this response can be a really powerful way to um, rousing us into action. So we should think of these motivators or these emotions as motivators to fight uh, for what we want to save. And I think it's a bit unfortunate that the research on the most effective emotions in climate communication has really focused a lot of attention on fear. Um, it, it is true that fear and anger are are quite good at mobilizing ac action at the beginning. But what we also have to remember is to take a long view and remember that we are gonna be doing this work for the rest of our lives. And if, if fear and anger are our guiding emotions, then we are very quickly gonna burn out. So we have to think about what's the most sustainable strategy over the long haul as we're addressing um, climate injustice. Um, I think really the important thing here is to just resist the binary mindset that is like wanting to split our emotional responses into mutually exclusive camps, whether it's love versus grief or hope versus despair, because whenever we do that, then we, we end up dismissing the value of the dark emotions. Um, and I uh, the like a really good example of this binary thinking and how it plays out is um, the rise of climate doom in recent years. I think that binary thinking has really played into it. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the label of the climate doomer, somebody who says it's too late and that we're already screwed. 
And there are so many climate scientists and activists now who are arguing that our culture, at least within the U.S., somehow jumped from denial to doom like almost overnight. And that that has become the new big obstacle to motivating people. So on the slide, I have a couple quotes. Um, uh, climate scientist Jacqueline Gill has commented um, on her frustration with the media's focus on apocalyptic outcomes. Michael Mann um, makes a very similar argument. He's spent well over a decade in these legendary Twitter battles um, and media debates where he's running around debunking climate deniers. But then in his new book, he says, now he's redirecting all of that energy to rushing around debunking the climate doomers who say that it's too late to save ourselves. So he calls this the, the new climate war. And for me, it was kind of hard to like wrap my head around this initially, but I think it makes more sense um, as it's explained by psychologists like Leslie Davenport, who identify both of these positions as a basic psychic defense against the human discomfort with uncertainty and ambiguity. So we just don't like to be in a limbo state where we, we don't know what's gonna happen. And so sometimes that can lead to disavowal and just turning away, but other people go towards doom um, where you know it's, it's too late, we can't do anything. And Davenport says here, paradoxically moving um, to either one of those places provides a kind of psychological relief because it gets us out of that gray zone where we're having to stare into the void and sit with that ambivalence and uncertainty. So to bring this back to my point about grief, you know, it, it seems like doomers do acknowledge and embrace grief. That's not the problem. Their problem is that they misunderstand grief as an excuse for inaction. They see it as an endpoint rather than a doorway, um, as Margaret Kine Solomon so beautifully put it. Um, and then hope is the final emotion I wanna address um, before kind of going to my, my steps for my strategies for dealing with climate despair. Hope is the emotion that gets the most attention, I think just in, in more recent climate communication. Um, the climate movement is obsessed with hope. So if you make a film or write a book, um, it's like this unspoken rule that it has to end on a hopeful note. Um, and from my own experience, it's the most common and predictable question that I get in the Q&A after my talks. People wanna know like, what gives you hope? Um, it's also a really polarizing concept that also gets split into that binary thinking that I mentioned where it's either a panacea, right? Like the only thing that will save us, or on the other hand, it gets dismissed as like the trope of fools who just don't get how bad things really are. So I think it's more useful to think about that difference in terms of uh, the difference between passive hope and active hope. Um, and, and the first version is essentially a kind of wish for a happy ending, something that might keep you on the sidelines by putting off action onto the future or onto other people. Um, and that's why I think uh, people will rightfully dismiss that kind of hope as counterproductive. Um, another pitfall of this passive understanding of hope is that it's based on an expectation of a particular outcome. And that's really problematic in a reality where setbacks are inevitable and like we don't know how this movie is going to end. Um, and, and if we need assurance of success before we act, that's a really bad starting point in a situation where there's so much uncertainty and, and the odds are quite challenging um, on many fronts, but th they might be much better than we realize on others. Um, actually, I wanted to go back to that previous uh, slide with Vaclav Havel. Um, so in his famous definition of hope, the, the question of probability is really irrelevant. And for those of you who are familiar um, with Havel, he was a a major figure in um, creating the Czech Republic after the fall of communism in the Soviet Union. And after spending many years as a political prisoner, he wrote, hope is not the same thing as optimism. It is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. And that's really the trick is to, is to locate our motivation or identify our motivation with our values and a sense of justice. Because unlike outcomes, values 
can never be taken away. Um, and so I, even when things seem hopeless, it's that sense of purpose that keeps us going. Um, and so I think a lot of people these days um, who do this work really prefer the language of purpose or meaning instead of hope. Other people, again, you know, will use that term active hope or radical hope. Um, Diego Orgetas Ortiz is a Costa Rican climate writer who talks about this in a piece where he wrote, real, good, useful hope has nothing to do with positive news. Instead, it is profoundly linked with action, both ours and that of others alongside us. There's only one way to earn hope, and that's rolling up our sleeves. It's a really powerful way to frame hope as something that we have to earn or something that we do rather than something that we just get to have, right? So kind of thinking about it as a verb. Um, but, but to wrap all this up, I, I do want us to keep in mind that hope is not actually the end game. Getting people to take collective action is, is what we want, right? Not just making people feel hopeful regardless of, of what happens out there. So while there are multiple steps in managing climate anxiety and distress that I'm about to list off, and my podcast also walks listeners through all of these steps in a lot of detail, getting actively engaged in climate solutions, which is number five, is really at the heart of this entire list of recommendations. That's kind of what we're building up to. So this is the checklist that I use with my own students. You'll see with the very first one, I think the most important place to start is just acknowledging and making space to talk about our emotional responses to climate upheaval, like we did you know, at the beginning of this Zoom chat. We can do this really in any setting. It might seem like too simplistic to be of value, but it is way more profound than um, you might think at first glance. And that's because a huge part of people's depression and anxiety comes from feeling alone or isolated. And the research bears this out where, you know, we've all experienced that, that kind of profound dark question where you wonder like, oh my gosh, am I the only one who feels this way? Um, th that is not only personally distressing to feel so isolated, but it is also very politically debilitating. And that same research shows that when people feel isolated, they are much less likely to take action. So when you openly acknowledge and talk about those emotional responses, that in itself helps create community and solidarity, which counteracts that perception of isolation. Um, so I, I think another insight here about this power of acknowledging painful feelings is captured by the psychologist Rosemary Randall. And she points out like, you know, sure, we can repress the painful stuff. And most of us have a lot of practice doing it because we have to get through the day, right? I got to study for midterms. I got to do my job. I can't just be dwell dwelling in, in dark feelings all the time. But if you completely are shutting them down and suppressing them, what is the cost of that? Continually pushing that grief out of the way and pretending that things are okay um, leads to disconnection and, and avoidance where, um, and in this quote, Randall says, the present continues to feel safe, but at the expense of the future becoming terrifying. On the one hand, nightmare, on the other, false comfort. Um, a third reason that the acknowledgement is so crucial is simply because our culture doesn't really have established norms for recognizing or mourning the loss of nature. Um, and the reason that that is, is so problematic is because mourning, grieving, is a social process. And we already know this in the case of familiar cultural norms around the death of a person, right? There is a reason that across cultures and throughout the ages, people who lose a loved one turn to social rituals like funerals and memorials and vigils even practices that seem really kind of trivial, like sending sympathy cards or flowers, whether it's joining support groups or getting help from books or therapists that specialize in bereavement, like all of those structures are there. And the social nature of that um, validates our pain and it removes our isolation from others, which again, that is healing in itself. But then when we start talking about grief, for something like the disappearance of snow on our mountains, 
um, or the fact that you can't go outside in the summer or the death of millions of animals in, in a wildfire, um, there aren't established social structures to, to grieve that. So this is what's known uh, on the slide I mentioned as, as disenfranchised grief, um, where it's essentially made invisible and that deepens the harm that we experience. Okay, so that's the starting point, number one, and why I think it's so important. Then the second point has to do with reframing. And so I really encourage my students to see their eco-anxiety as a moral emotion and reject any framing that suggests that eco-anxiety is a dysfunction or a mental illness. Um, that's really problematic because it locates um, it locates the problem in the individual instead of in the larger social structure. Carolyn Hickman is a really well-known climate psychologist who puts this at the core of all of her work. Um, in particular, she provides a lot of therapy to young kids, and she talks to them about how climate their climate anxiety arises from a sense of compassion and a desire for, for justice. And, you know, there's so many others who've made arguments along these lines. Um, the two quotes in the box here, I always like to, to share. Um, the one from Jiddu Krishnamurti, it is no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So we might think about ways that you can use that reframing both for yourself, but also for helping others. So, you know, when somebody shares one of these dark emotions that are just spiraling into despair, can you help them recognize their response actually as a sign of compassion and emotional engagement? Um, how their anger and outrage actually arises from injustice. Or if they share fear about the future, that itself is um, a, a, a way of um, showing trust and courage to be able to speak openly. Um, even uncertainty, um, the very condition is, uh, that's the very condition where creativity and renewal become possible, right? So you can go on and on with, with these um forms of reframing that really kind of put it in a more healthy um, and active light. Then number three is um, about rewriting the story. And I have to say my, my background is in the humanities. Uh, so this one's really, really important to me. Humans live their lives by stories. And it doesn't matter if we're trying to make sense of the world or understand ourselves or envisioning the future or the past. We do all of that through stories. And so it's very important to be aware of the kinds of narratives that you are consuming every day and also circulating yourself. Most of the information that people get about the state of our planet comes from the media. And media research shows that 85% of that environmental news is told in a negative frame. And it is deliberately designed that way. It's not just because, you know, these media corporations are uh, do-gooders who like, you know, want to save the planet and they think this is the most effective way to do it. The news is actually a profit-driven enterprise that can't survive unless it, it draws our eyeballs to the screen. And so the sensational stories like fires and destruction and hurricanes are going to get more play than the nuanced stories of community change and long-term, um, you know, behind the scenes work of generating solutions. I mean, that kind of stuff is kind of like boring from, um, you know, a, a, a news standpoint. And then we also have to be aware that the addictive nature of catastrophic news is intentionally engineered to keep us coming back for more. And brain scans will, will show, and I think when Sarah Jaquette Ray uh, comes and visits you in the winter. She's looked a lot at how people get a dopamine hit just by checking back on their devices again and again to catch up on the, the latest updates. But the cumulative effect of that is it creates a perception that we're living in an apocalypse. And any of us can probably remember times where we've gotten swept up into these doom scrolling loops, whether it's during an election or a disaster or any time when you just cannot stop refreshing and checking and like the moment where you step away from your device, there's a physical reaction where you feel like you're vulnerable um, and you're compromising your own survival in a way because like we are hardwired to think that we need to know what's going on to make sure that we're safe. 
And that fixation with catastrophic stories is, it's not only exacerbated by media companies, but on another level, it's actually a function of our own psychological makeup. So in um, psychology, this is known as the negativity bias, um, and Sarah Jaquette Ray will probably talk about this as well, but there's interesting research on how if we see an equal amount of good information and bad information, our minds will automatically pay more attention to the bad stuff. And there's a decent evolutionary uh, you know, uh, reason for that, because you know, if we're living in a world of poisonous snakes and saber-toothed tigers, it's actually to an advance, our advantage to have a brain that's hyper aware of anything that might be a threat. But then if you, if you translate that into today's world where our images are being broadcast from every corner of the world to show us every single bad thing that's happening uh, and our screens are in front of us 24 um, seven, our, our nervous system just is not able to tolerate that relentless stress. And that's where we start to see those chronic psychological effects that wear down our mental health over time. So this is like a tricky um, kind of tightrope that we have to walk because I'm not advocating that we sugarcoat our reality or indulge in, in toxic positivity to avoid the bad news. But if we want to build resilience, just being consciously aware that the media is actively manipulating your negativity bias, right? Even if you want to still read the story, but understand what, you know, the, the motives are for be, that being put out there. That's a really crucial first step. Um, and it's also, most importantly, an opportunity to remember that those catastrophic stories are only one version of reality. Because at the exact same time, you have a whole universe of empowering stories that are happening. Um, every person who's engaged in creating change in every part of the world, in any way that you can think of, whether it's financial markets, technology, social justice movements, schools, energy, you know, food and agriculture. The headlines that I put on this slide, these are just screenshots that I took um, last month when I was just looking at news from September alone. These are the kinds of solutions-based stories that are, you know, just don't get the airtime, but they are every bit as real. So if you're thinking about, okay, well, where do I find that? I think it's it's helpful to, to seek out the kind of groups that will aggregate this stuff for you. So on the top left, I really like um, Grist, which is local to our area. They have a newsletter called The Beacon that sends you a daily dose of good climate news. Um, and then on the right top hand corner, um, is the Solutions Journalism Network is a consortium that reports on solutions to problems. And this is across the spectrum, not just with climate. Um, their goal, it's not like they're trying to avoid the bad news and they will still like tell that part. But what they add in is the missing piece that doesn't get covered in mainstream accounts, which is how people are responding. And the reason that they do this, they're not just trying to make us feel good, but they actually they want to provide a template for interventions that have worked in one context so that readers can apply them in others. So these are kinds of initiatives. A lot of them are crowdsourced. Um, so that's like alternative stories you could find um, it for news and journalism. Also in the realm of fiction and literature, one alternative I really like, um, I'm going to drop this um, link in the chat here. Um, this is also from Grist and, um, it's imagine 20 or 2020 or 2200, <laughs> uh, climate fiction for future ancestors. So this is a compilation of stories, uh, that are submitted by writers from around the world who are imagining these intersectional worlds of community-based solutions and, and regeneration. So they run a contest every year for the best stories, and then those are the ones that get published. Okay, so this leaves me, the cynic in me, with the question that always comes up. It's like, well, what if we're just indulging in wishful thinking and we're soothing ourselves as the world burns down, right? Is it possible that these hopeful stories are just another form of escapism? And, and that question leads to my last point under this step number three, which is that Stories have real implications for the kind of future that we're going to create. Um, if any of you are familiar with Adrienne Marie Brown, she talks about how we're actually involved right now in an imagination battle. Um, our perception that the existing political and economic institutions are inevitable 
that gets reinforced when we never see alternative stories. And of course, the, the dominant genre of the future is apocalypse, everywhere from science fiction to Hollywood film to mainstream news. I really like um, Joanna Macy's analysis for this, where she breaks down the three dominant stories that are currently competing to define our moment. So in the first one, um, this is the business as usual story, which you know just wants to preserve the status quo. And so they argue that don't worry about it because we're gonna have economic growth and technology and the free market, and eventually that'll lead to prosperity for everybody. The second version is the story of the great unraveling, which says we're headed for social and ecological collapse, mass extinction. Um, we're gonna see rising conflict over diminishing resources, this is the dominant narrative that the climate movement has really been stuck in for generations. And then the third story is what Macy calls the great turning. And that's an account that really sees this moment right now as where we have this possibility for profound social transformation, where we can actually move to environmental justice, finally. And I think this is the most important point that Macy makes here. This is the box at the bottom. She says, don't argue over which of these three stories is correct, because they are all happening. The real question is, which one do we want to invest in? And she writes that that third story of transition and recovery and healing is where we will turn when we acknowledge that the first story is leading us to catastrophe, but we refuse to let the second story have the last word. Civil rights activist and filmmaker and poet Valerie Kaur boils all of this down to a single sentence when she asks, what if the darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but a darkness of the womb, right? So, so what story do you want to live in? Is this moment a womb or a tomb? I think at time here, okay, I'm gonna wrap up here in about uh, four minutes or so. Uh, number four is to connect. Um, and I already noted, you know, acknowledging and talking openly about eco grief is its own way of connecting and building community. Um, but the other point I'll make here is oftentimes the source of our despair isn't the crisis itself so much as a longing for fellowship or the absence of a sense of purpose in the midst of that difficulty. Um, Rebecca Solnit has like one of the best accounts I know in making this point. Um, her book, A Paradise Built in Hell, which is like packed with all of this research on how throughout history, when you look at periods of crisis like wars or natural disasters, you actually see accounts of, of people who lived through them and responded to them on the front line where their spiritual lives and a kind of a deep sense of meaning, they were not inhibited because of those events. Um, but the opposite became true, that their sense of purpose um, and the fellowship that we all crave was actually deepened through that adversity. And that actually, this is kind of counterintuitive, but there's this great joy that comes um, and, and a sense of adventure of knowing that you're part of a historic mo movement that's rising up to confront that, um, you know, that greatest challenge of your time. So, okay, so how do you connect then? Um, where do you find these connections? The resources page on my website, I list um, a number of groups, whether you want to meet with them virtually or in person, but these are all specifically groups that are trying to build community around eco-anxiety and, and difficult responses to the, the climate crisis. Um, some of them are like meetings that you can just join, or and other ones actually will give you templates and instructions so you can facilitate your own, um, whether it's at school or in you know your, your whatever group. Um, the second one down, the Climate Courage Workshops are like really international. So you're going to log in and you're going to meet, um, you know, youth activists in Brazil or Australia or, you know, ac across um, the African continent um, who are like, you know, may maybe dealing with some of the same anxiety that, that you are. And so it's important to remember again, like how pervasive this is. Um, the Good Grief Network is also really fantastic. It's based on the kind of the 10 steps from Alcoholics Anonymous um, that they have translated into this um, um, new topic. And then the last one, um, get engaged and take action. 
I, I do want to like put out that caveat that I already mentioned about immediately trying to jump to action as a way of avoiding the, the hard feelings that we feel. Like that's not the point. We don't want to do that. But in the same way that action shouldn't excuse us from self-reflection, neither should those painful feelings excuse us from doing the work. And it's really important to keep in mind that you actually can walk and chew gum at the same time. You can, you can feel distressed and still show up to do the work that needs doing. And in fact, it's the, the, the diving into the work itself, which is a very effective antidote to despair. And so that is the answer that I give when people always ask me, how do we maintain hope? And my answer is just don't get fixated on cultivating hope. If you do the work, the hope will come. And it's not just because you, you know, you think that or you're going to convince yourself that showing up to a climate march or going to a community garden and, and doing something on Saturday afternoon, that that's going to tip the scales. Um, the real power of getting engaged is that it, it is building that solidarity that we need to do this work. And cognitive psychologists tell us over and over again, we have to imagine ourselves as part of a team. Um, and that the reason that's so important is because, again, we, we're so wrapped up with this um, realization, I think, that's growing that individual actions really aren't significant enough to matter, that we need these like massive transformations of the system itself. And that can be good news or bad news. For my students, they will say, well, I just feel so dwarfed. It feels so futile because my personal impact is a drop in the bucket. So why even, even bother, right? Um, that drop in the bucket imaginary, Sarah Jaquette Ray talks a lot about this it's everywhere in climate discussions. That is a very American or Western individualistic response. And frankly, it's one that the fossil fuel industry loves to perpetuate. Uh, I bet you most of you here have heard by now, BP is, is the organization that invented the carbon footprint cal uh, calculator. They want us to focus on our personal responsibility and our individual habits rather than engaging in mass movements to transform the larger system. Um, but if we see ourselves as working collectively rather than individually, then you can start recognizing how all of these individual contributions sync up with a larger network of change. If any of you are familiar with Adrienne Marie Brown's book, Emergent Strategy, um, that's you know her kind of um, banner for it, right? Emergent Strategy being a movement that spirals out from all kinds of small and local actions um, and connections to create these much larger complex systems. It's another one of the books here that I would highly recommend. So to end this, um, I, I wanna say that I think this is where we can recognize some very good news at the heart of the climate crisis. And that is that the solution to the existential loneliness many of us feel is the same solution um, as the one we need for climate change, that they both boil down to solidarity and collective action. So again, if you want specific ideas or opportunities for taking action in, in that regard, look at the resources page of my website or you know, any of the thousand other climate groups who are ready to welcome you, welcome you into the movement. Um, um, and it, um, if you want to connect with me also on social media, I, I try to post new talks and workshops and podcast episodes. Um, so I'll, I'll provide those updates there. I really am not on Twitter very much, um, but Instagram I'll, I'll tend to use a little bit more. Um, and in terms of the books for further reading on this topic, the, I'm, I'm showing the ones here that are probably my favorites. Um, a lot of this material that I shared today comes from these researchers. So I really wanna acknowledge the extraordinary work of my colleagues and friends who are featured here. Thank you.